as it looks like in the introduction, large companies are not moving very quickly, and startups have a huge playground to disrupt. And the good news is, you know, we have a much better process now to create startups. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I think until now, and I'm being a bit provocative here, we've been pretty much in the stone age when it comes to the tools we use to create startups. I think there's a better answer now. Okay? So how many of you have um, taken some time to write a business plan? Who of you has ever written a business plan? Okay. How much time did you spend on your business plan? Um, a semester. A semester, okay, great. <laughs> right. How much time have you spent on your business plan? A couple weeks. Okay, a couple of weeks. Who spent more than two months? Okay, you wasted your time, okay? Because this is the old way of doing things. Writing a business plan and thinking if we add a lot of detail and refine it and polish it, your idea is actually going to work. Well, it turns out it's not the truth because who of you has heard of Steve Blank? There's this great quote where he says, no business plan survives the first contact with customers. So if you spend two or three months on it, you just wasted your time because as soon as your business plan confronts reality and you know what's going to happen, you have a good plan. What do you know about Steve Blank? <laughs> Who is that? Are you Steve Blank? I mean, you don't, you don't know anything about Steve Blank. <laughs> <laughs> so, Let's welcome Steve Blank. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. So, this actually didn't turn out the way it should have turned out. Yeah. <laughs> You're prompted to come much later. <laughs> you know what? I saw my picture, Alexander, and I thought, you know, why don't we just start here and, and talk about, um, you know, burning your business plan. Let's and then, then I'll sit down, and then you can continue, and I'll come back. Let's do that. I mean, why, why did you come up with this quote? I mean, that's the way we've done entrepreneurship for, you know, the last decades. So, so one of the things that's really kind of interesting is that if you've done a business plan, how many of you did it? Raise your hand again. Now, how many of you, when you took that business plan and actually started a company, found that the world worked exactly like your plan? Anybody? Yeah? Uh, well, you know, I want to invest in you because you're pressing. What we actually kind of now know. They're filming, so you need to. What we now know is that no business plan survives first contact with customers. We know that as a fact. Why? Because there's no way that you can theoretically pre-compute all the variables that occur in the real world, as smart as you are. In fact, any computer science people in the room? Anyway? So entrepreneurship is an NP-complete problem. That means it's theoretically incalculable. You just can't calculate all the possible permutations and combinations. But if we had a process, which Alexander's going to talk about, we could actually turn an NP complete problem into what's called an NP problem, meaning just very hard. Right? Entrepreneurship still is very hard. And I have to tell you that, and then I'll sit down. Now, but I always have to tell a story. I, I used to get students, you know, who because I used to teach how to write a business plan, which first started me think about why this is wrong. They'd say, Professor Blank, can we have coffee? Sure, let's have coffee. What's the problem? Well, you know, like, we wrote our business plan, and now we launched our company. Great. Well, what happened? Well, the customers aren't behaving as per our plan. <laughs> and so I suggested casually, perhaps you ought to wrap your, the product with a copy of the business plan so they would know what to do. <laughs> and they started taking notes, wrap the product with plan. <laughs> and then I realized that perhaps we needed to think about the problem much differently than thinking that we could pre-compute every possible case. And that's where the business model came in. So I'm going to sit down and let you talk about that. Call me back up when you're ready. Okay, and think about some questions already because, whoops, um, Steve and I will have a chat, but we'll try to bring you in. Um, this is a great opportunity to ask both of us a question. So thanks, Steve. I think this is for the fun. Okay, business plans as a document, not going to help us create successful startups, but Planning is still a crucial thing. 
not the business plan that's important, but it's planning. Now, what do you need to plan? In fact, you need to plan the process for the search of your business model. How do you search for your business model? How do you figure out if your business model is going to work? And that's what Steve and I are going to talk about a little bit um, over the next uh, 60, 70 minutes. But I want to start with the buzz group first. I'm using this word business model all the time. Who's never ever used the word business model? Never? Who's never used it? Okay. You'd be the, probably the sixth person I've ever met who's never used the word business model. So you all know what a business model is, right? And you use the word, you're smart students, so you know, you know what it is. So I want you to discuss with your seat neighbor for two minutes, hey, what's a business model? I want you to discuss that, write down your definition. What's a business model, okay? With your seat neighbor, let's go two minutes. What's a business model? Wait, what's Um, let's see, what's a, what's a business model? Who, who looked this up on Google? <laughs> Wikipedia? Okay. You always get some, I mean, it's smart, right? It's not cheating. But what's a business model? And let me ask those first who haven't read the book, because you might have a biased opinion. So what's a business model? What's a business model? Uh, I just wrote a, I meant some a company will generate revenues. How a company generates revenues. Okay, first definition. What came up in, uh, well, you're biased. <laughs> Your conversation, your bias. What came up in your conversation? What's a business model? Uh, we sort of said as a proposal for what you're going to do and how. So okay, a proposal what? of what you're going to do and how. So that's pretty different from what we heard before, right? So different definition. So um, let's see over here. What's a business model? Yeah. What are you? How to monetize and product. So two two concepts: monetization, product. Two elements to mention. Maybe over over there somewhere. Yeah. Shyly looking away now that I'm pointing over there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you with a blue bottle there. What's a business model? Uh, same thing. Way to generate revenue. <laughs> the same thing. A way to generate revenue. Yeah. Okay. How to deliver value to a customer. Okay. Great. New new two new concepts. How to deliver value. Thank you very much for bringing up customers as well. That's pretty important, right? Have you ever seen a business model without customers? It's those who go bankrupt. Uh, identifying a need in the market and describing how you're going to fill it. Another concept here, identifying a need and then how to fulfill it. So more about channels. I ask this question everywhere in the world. I travel quite a bit from Brazil to Russia. And you know what the answers I get is this. <laughs> you know this story in Tower, Tower of Babel? God wanted to, he, he, people wanted to build a, a building that goes all the way to heaven. God got scared, came down, created languages so people couldn't speak to each other anymore. <laughs> same thing for business models. People are not speaking about the same thing. They're using the same word, but they have a totally different concept in their mind. Some talk about channels, some about monetization, some talk about value. It's very confusing. We're not using the same word. So we lack a clear language to discuss business models. That's pretty basic. Lacking a clear language to discuss business models and ultimately <coughs> come up with great business models. So let's, let's look at how a meeting could turn out where the business model is the center topic. This could be a startup wanting to create a new business model for a product. Or it could be a large corporation saying, hey, we need to reinvent our business model. You know how this conversation is going to look? It's going to look like this. A group of smart people, <laughs> somebody starts, you know, maybe it's the CEO, maybe it's the visionary behind the startup, blah, blah, blah. Huh? We're not speaking the same language, so, huh? Blah, 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 next person's turn. Okay, it goes on. Mm -hmm. Didn't really get it. Next person's turn, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And the conversation goes on. What do you think you have after three hours? Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. You know how you call this phenomenon, this specific phenomenon, this kind of thing? Some people usually tell me it's a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> There's a more specific term 
And that term is called blah, blah, blah. <laughs> A friend of mine, Dan Rome, wrote a book about the topic called Blah, 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 What to Do When Words Don't Work. And when it comes to the business model topic, we talk a lot, but we don't understand each other very well. And the result is that we're not very good at designing business models or changing business models. So what I suggest we do, and some of you know about the business model canvas, and we can introduce this in a minute, is that we use a more visual language to have better conversations around business models in order to come up with better business models, okay? So, how do we get over this blah, blah, blah? It's gonna be the topic for the next 60 minutes. We're gonna look at three issues. First one is language. How does that language look like? Then, a couple of strategies to think about business models. How can we be less or more sophisticated? And the last thing, Experiments, and that's where I'm going to get Steve <laughs> to share his experience because you know Steve has done eight startups, some more successful than others, and a lot of learning, and actually a pretty amazing process that came out of this. Okay, so does that sound interesting? Yes. Is that going to keep you here until <laughs> 6:30, 7:30? Oh, 6:30 is not much of a challenge. Right? <laughs> Could we create a better language to discuss business models? And I started working on that. And what I came up with, with Yves Pinier, who's my co-author now, is a visual language. I think visual is very important here. And in the work I've done over the last couple of years with senior executives and with startups is that, you know what? The visual language part is pretty crucial to having good conversations. The higher you get in a company, the less you use visual tools. Look at a meeting room when you're talking to the IT department. They have whiteboards all over the place. When you're in the boardroom, you know what you're going to get? I've mentioned Geneva-based private banks. You know what you're going to get? You're going to get carpets and pictures of the founders. Where are you going to put up your sticky notes? On the carpets, doesn't stick. On the noses of the founders, well, they're going to throw you out of the room. The meeting rooms that we have today are not geared to do the kind of work and processes that we need in organizations, large organizations, and in startups. Okay? So, so what is this about? Um, the book Business Model Generation and an approach that's called the Business Model Canvas. Who's heard of the Business Model Canvas before? Okay, quite a bit. Who has it this first time? First timer? Great. So it's a bit of a mix. I'll show you a little video to introduce this, and then I'm going to get you to work on a case immediately. Now you know why you have these here, because I want to get you to work. Okay, I'm Swiss. I don't just talk. My son actually says talking is not working. He's eight years old. That's why I decided to get you to work. So I'm not the only one here who's not working. Good. Business model canvas. What is this? It's a language to better describe business models based on nine building blocks. Let's watch this little two minute video. An organization's business model can be described with nine basic building blocks. Your customer segments, your value proposition for each segment, the channels to reach customers, customer relationships you establish, the revenue streams you generate, the key resources and key activities you require to create value, the key partners, and the cost structure of the business model. But it's not sufficient to just enumerate the nine building blocks. What you really want to do is to map them out on a pre-structured canvas. This is what we call the Business Model Canvas, a tool that helps you map, discuss, design and invent new business models. Let's briefly go through the nine building blocks, starting with the customer segments. These are all the people or organisations for which you're creating value. This includes simple users and paying customers. For each segment, you have a specific value proposition. These are the bundles of products and services that create value for your customers. The channels describe through which touch points you're interacting with customers and delivering value. The customer relationships outline the type of relationship you're establishing with your customers. The revenue streams make clear how and through which pricing mechanisms your business model is capturing value. Then you need to describe the infrastructure to create, deliver and capture value. The key resources show which assets are indispensable in your business model. The key activities show which things you really need to be able to perform well. The 
key partners show who can help you leverage your business model, since you won't own all key resources yourself, nor will you perform all key activities. Then once you understand your business model's infrastructure, you'll also have an idea of its cost structure. So with the business model canvas, you can map out your entire business model in one image. This works for startup entrepreneurs just as well as for the most senior executives. So when I was talking about visual thinking, this is what I meant. Who are my customer segments? Sticky note. What am I offering them? Sticky note. How am I reaching them? Sticky note. What do I need to actually do that? Sticky note. Key resources, right? So you start mapping this out. And there's no way you can hide behind fuzzy words, blah, blah, blah anymore. You're going to make it crystal clear. So in fact, when you start doing this, you're going to negotiate what you want to put up there. And after a meeting, you're going to have a clear output. Now, the individual concepts here, customer segments, channels, revenue streams, key resources, none of them is new, right, as an individual concept. If you've been doing business or studying business, none of that is going to blow you away. But it's pretty rare that executives or entrepreneurs look at all nine boxes and how they work together. Having this holistic picture and figuring out what's the story. Not just the product. Okay, product innovation, I think, is becoming a commodity. What you really want to figure out is how do these nine building blocks play together create a successful business model and give you a competitive advantage compared to others. That's what you want to figure out. Okay? So here is the canvas I'm going to give you, one that I can ask you just to hand them out <coughs> while I introduce the case. So we're going to look at a small example. Coming from Switzerland, pick one each, you're going to work on them in groups of two with the sticky notes. And we're going to talk about coffee at this time of the day. Coffee is probably a good thing to talk about. I'm an espresso a fanatic. So we're going to talk about coffee, which is a commodities business. Now, the interesting question, because I have the data there for Switzerland, is how much less or more do you think Swiss households pay for coffee consumed at home? What would your guess be? Do we spend 20% less? Do we spend 20% more? in this commodities business, for coffee consumed at home. What would your guess be? Some of you might have seen this on the web because I did a video about it, but what would your guess be? For those who don't know, 20% less, 20% more? 10 times less. 10 times less. Okay, that's what you would expect in a commodities business. And they changed the business model to make it extremely cheap. Okay, anybody else? Yeah? Ooh, 10 times more. 10 times more, they got the whole range. Both you could call the investors in Silicon Valley. That's great. <laughs> Turns out, there's more on that end. It's not 10 times more, but almost. 600 to 800% more. And you know, Swiss are not known for throwing money out of the window. Not as extreme as the Dutch, but getting us to pay six to eight times more is pretty, pretty substantial. Now, how, how did anybody get us to pay six to eight times more? You have an idea? Coffee machine and capsules. Coffee machine and pods, right? And, and George Clooney, actually everywhere in the world except for the US, he stands for this brand here, Nespresso. And Nespresso is part of the biggest food company in the world, Nestle. And they reinvented the espresso part of the coffee business. They came up with a machine, pretty well designed, reminds you almost of an Apple product, and pods. The way it works, you take a pod, an aluminum pod with gray coffee inside, you put it in the machine, you press a button, and out comes a good espresso. Okay? When I say good one, it's one that Italians would call an espresso, okay? not Americans. I'm not finished here. <laughs> Pretty good espresso. Question to you now is, what did they do with that machine and those pods to get to these results? I want you to think about the business model. So the results are pretty amazing. It's still one of the fastest growing businesses inside this food empire, Nestle, doing almost 100 billion turnover. 30% growth rate per annum for the last 10 years. Now, for anybody else than a Silicon Valley startup, this is pretty good. Okay? Particularly if you're large, if you're GE, getting 30% growth rates, that's pretty, pretty impressive. I showed this to Google, I was talking at Google, and they looked at me and said, 
<laughs> and if you're in Switzerland or any other country, 30%, it's pretty much. And it represents, with one product line, $3.8 billion, uh, $3 billion business. That's pretty substantial for mainly one product. What I want you to figure out now, in a bus group, pick a different seat neighbor than before, turn the other way. And I want you to work on the business model canvas to sketch out what you think is the business model of Nespresso that produces these numbers. What is it in their business model, their building blocks, that make them so successful? So I'll give you some ground rules on how to use the canvas. So you have sticky notes, okay, and you have a canvas. Some ground rules here. First one is, tonight you will not write on a canvas. Okay? That is a crime. Why will you not write on a canvas? Because God gave you sticky notes. Okay? So what I want you to do is for every building block that you think is important in the business model, I want you to take a sticky note and put it up. And these are studies, so they're electrostatic. If you take three at a time, they're not going to stick. So people, you need to make sure you just take one. Okay. Now, that's the first rule. The second rule is, don't ever, don't ever put bullet points on a sticky note, please. <laughs> okay, bullet points are a crime. Look, there are no bullet points here. But bullet points are on sticky notes, it's what puts you in prison in Switzerland, okay? So don't do it. And I'll tell you why, there's a reason for this. I'm not joking. Because if you have, see I took two, it doesn't really work. If you have each block individually, so let's say you have two customer segments and you have them up as separate um, sticky notes, you can ask yourself, well, what if this customer segment disappears or I can't actually sell to them? What's going to be the ripple effect or the impact on the rest of the business model? So you can start taking things away, right? You can start playing with your business model if each piece is literally a building block, okay? So no bullet point. Now, enough talking, I want to get you to work for eight minutes. Now let's say six minutes, okay, um, on the business model of Nespresso. Six minutes, what's the business model of Nespresso? Let's go. I sketch out how I would draw um, the business model, let me just ask you first, what do you think are the most important pieces in Nespresso's business model that made them so successful? What are the substantial blocks? Yeah. What do you draw? Yeah. Convenience. Convenience, right? Where would you put that in, in the canvas? Which? Value proposition. Yeah. It's in the value proposition. Yeah. Perfect. What else? Extremely convenient process, not as, as dirty, messy, yeah? It's also a high quality. High quality, so again, middle box, right? Get value proposition. What, what else? Enter which box? Uh, I would put that under a key resource. Key resources. In fact, without patents, without having protection of their intellectual property, their whole business model would crumble. You'll see why. Let's see why you think this is so important. Why am I telling you this is so important? Why is IP so important? Somebody else, yeah. Well, I'm just going to say in the context of the espresso, it's got that super high pressure, free bar, or something, something that they have okay. in the box. Okay, so they want to protect their, their technology. Okay, could be. It's actually something else. It goes in that direction. It's, that's not enough, yeah? It's super easy to copy. I know it could, could copy that. Could copy what? Like uh, this system, you know, whatever they have by it. Okay, whatever they have patented, we're still thinking about product a bit here. Okay, anybody else? Let's, let's move on for a bit. We'll get back to this. What are the other most important business model building blocks here? Yeah. Um, I'd say the customer segment being mass market, that they're appealing to a market that might not necessarily have bought that fine espresso that's. Okay, that's could experience. be. So widening up, reaching a broader market, non espresso drinkers, yeah? The channels. Uh, channels? So what's interesting about the channels? The stores are basically. Their cafes or their sales as well. 
Okay. Interesting. So you have here, you have a Fifth Avenue, you have an espresso store, you have at the Champs Elysees, you have an espresso store. These are coffee temples. Actually, in, in Paris, you have an alt you have three altars with different tastes. You go smell the coffee. Okay, they have they built temples there. But you know what? That's not the most powerful part of their channel strategy. That's just an add-on. Something else. Anybody know what they've done that's pretty powerful in the channels? No? Competitive revenue stream. Pretty competitive revenue stream. You know what? Let me map this out. We could discuss this further, but we got some other things to do tonight. And I'll, I'll focus on illustrating what's interesting in their business model that goes beyond the product and the value proposition. So first thing is, they sell the Nespresso machines through any retail outlet possible, mainly to households. 80 to 85% of the market is still households, which means they're going to sell in a transactional sales. They're going to earn money once from a machine, and maybe three years later. Okay? But they're not interested in that money. Most of that goes to the machine manufacturers, whom they partner. Okay? But now for the pods, they have a totally different strategy. You won't find pods in general retail only in their own stores, in their own channels. Okay? So they sell the Nespresso pods to different channels, their own channels. Started out with mail order, then call centers, now obviously Nespresso.com, and the latest edition were the stores. Why do they have this differentiated strategy where they sell the machine through retail, but not the pods, the pods only through their own channels? Why do they do that? And that means they need to actually build a very costly resource. Why do they do that? Because they generate an ongoing revenue stream with probably very high margin, and okay. they do it with sort of a very premium okay. feel to hook you in. Because okay. once you've bought the machine, Right. Already through, so then your loyalty will go way up because you're already semi-committed. But well, why wouldn't they do that with retail? Because you know they have a larger reach if they do retail. They wouldn't have to build their own channels. They could ask for those same margins through retail. They could control the pricing. They control the pricing. No shelf space. No shelf space. No shelf space. Anybody of you an entrepreneur here? Okay, I hope not because you don't get this question right. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. <laughs> well, the first one is, and you might have said that and I didn't understand it. The first one is, if you have an intermediary, you're giving away a lot of margin, right? So if you don't have an intermediary, you, know, you charge six to eight times more and you keep all the money. That sounds pretty good. That's why this is a profit-spitting machine. That's the first part. Now, why can they do that? And you got that one correct is because once you've got the machine, you are, yeah, I wouldn't use that word in the US, okay? You're not from America. Okay? I am. Oh yeah? Okay, I won't say that, if, yeah. You're trapped. <laughs> or you have very high switching costs. Once you have that machine, you can only use one type of pod, the Nespresso pods, and this is where the patents come in. If they don't have patents to defend that kind of pod, Anybody could make these pods and it would destroy the margins. But why can they do that? Because you have um, 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 the, the pods, uh, the, the, the pattern, right? Now, why do they sell the machines through retail? Why do they actually choose a different channel for the machines? Wider reach. Wider reach? Why is wider reach important for the machines? The more machines, the more projects. The more machines are out there, the bigger the market. So they have this dual strategy. That's pretty sophisticated. While everything is true that you said on the value proposition, what they're competing on is not just the value proposition, but an incredibly sophisticated business model, channel strategy here, which, you know, here at the front stage, we just said a couple of things, which results in recurring, repetitive revenues locks in the customer, but now also has implications on this side. The first thing you came up with, hey, patents are important. What else is important key resources to do what we have on the right hand side? What else? What else do we need in terms of key resources, key assets to actually do this over here? We've got the channels, we got patents, what else? What else do you need if you're doing this kind of business? Real estate. 
your list there. Okay, you'll put that in channels if you if you have your Nespresso store. <coughs> what else do you need? You need strong supply. You need coffee, yeah. right? And they focus on high quality coffee, so coffee is an important resource. What else? I think consumer business, what's one of the most important? Marketing would be up here. What does that result in in terms of key resource? Brand. Brand. If you don't have brand in this type of business, you're dead. Okay. So George Clooney is there to build a brand. So key resources, yeah, a couple of things. Patents, brand, coffee, production facilities. They don't make the machines, but they churn out 8 to 12 billion pods every year themselves. Most of that in Switzerland, and then they push it out to the world. Okay. Key activities, business and consumer distribution, marketing, um, supply chain management. Here's an interesting one. It's the first time Nestle as a company sells to individual households, which means they need to be able to send small boxes to households and not big pallets to retailers. That's a big shift. <coughs> Nestle doesn't know how to handle that. This is a totally new business model. And if you know this, very quickly you get all the costs here. The interesting thing is, we mapped out all the pieces. And what you do over here, in terms of the channel strategy, will have an impact over here. Okay? So this is why this kind of holistic thinking is really interesting. Because whatever you change in one block will have an impact on others. And I think innovation is increasingly going to happen in the holistic picture and not just in products and new channels. That makes sense? Follow me on this? Great. So, second thing I want to touch on is how can you use this, uh, this business model canvas in more or less sophisticated ways? Who's used the canvas for their own startup idea or in a company? Who's really used it? Doesn't just know about it, who's used it? Okay? We're going to look at that. But first thing I want to look at is what else can we learn from the Nespresso example. And this is one thing most technology entrepreneurs get wrong. You know what happened to their first business model? When they want to launch, it almost went bankrupt. Same product, same product, so you know, great coffee, um, very efficient, clean, convenient process. Same product, different business model, almost went bankrupt. This is how it looked. They were selling the Nespresso system in a joint venture with uh, machine manufacturers through the sales force of the machine manufacturer to offices. Two things didn't work. Offices were not interested, and the sales force of the machine manufacturers had no interest to sell this small machine. So they got that one wrong. And it's only after pivoting to a new business model, one that we saw, that it became successful. So what's the lesson here? The business model is often the difference between success and failure. It's not just the product. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying a great product is not something you need. I just think it's increasingly becoming a commodity. So one thing you've got to get right, but in addition to that, you need the right business model. It's both together. It's not or, it's and. Okay? Good. Now, more lessons very quickly. They went on with a similar machine focused on cappuccino drinkers. Who's a cappuccino drinker in the world? In the world? Who's a, an espresso drinker? Okay, who does both? That's an ab abnormal behavior. <laughs> <laughs> That's not supposed to happen. <laughs> so similar system, pods, machine. You'd say, well, okay, similar business model. No, they did a different business model. In fact, you can get everything in um, this Dolce Gusto system through retail because they're targeting a different market, so they're using a different business model. Here's my favorite one. They went on to create one called Babyness. <laughs> what if you're me into a great father? Five o'clock in the morning and you're <laughs> You get up, you know it's going to take you 30 seconds to put the pot in there, make the bottle hot, give it to the baby, go back to sleep. Right? <laughs> That's what they're trying to do. And here they have another different business model. They work more with pharmacies. So what's happening here is, this is the last one. They're doing one for tea. It's called specialty. But what's happening here is they're building a portfolio of business models. Now, 
Last point before I get Steve Black on, back on stage again, talk about testing business models, is for those of you who use the Canvas, I'm pretty curious to figure out how you used it, because there are different ways of using the Canvas. And let me just draw this. I'm going to have to use my fingers, so this might be a bit ugly. But I use my stylus every two weeks. Now, Okay, let me draw this. There we go. So I call these different levels of business model thinking. There's a, a level zero thinking. That should be a zero. That's when you focus on, let's test your visual thinking or understanding skills. When you focus on this, anybody know what this is? A what? Can anybody get it right? It's a value proposition. <laughs> if you look at your, look here, I mean, come on. <laughs> Pretty clear, no? <laughs> okay, it's a value proposition. Now, a lot of startups focus just on the product because they're oblivious to the fact that, hey, there are actually eight other building blocks, right? That doesn't mean the product is not important, but it's just one piece, okay? So I call these, how do you write oblivious in English? Oops, oblivious. Right? <laughs> They're oblivious to the fact that there's more to it. So now, after this lecture, you're already a lot smarter, so you know there's this business model canvas because, in fact, you can now do a level one strategy. And what is a level one strategy? Got this great tool, and now you figure out, hey, I can use this like a checklist, right? I got a product, right? Oh, I need a customer. Oh, maybe a channel would help. Revenue streams, great. Okay, outside of Silicon Valley, revenue streams are really important. <laughs> okay, and you have key resources, you have all that, right? So you start looking at that, and you use it like a checklist. I call this the beginner's approach. But it's already a step forward because you understand that, hey, it's all the pieces that you need. Now, when you get better at this, when you study business models like the one of Nespresso, you could look at Skype, you could look at tons of these business models. You won't just see this as a checklist, but you will figure out, do you still see this? Okay, sorry for my finger painting here. You will understand that, hey, I need a story where every piece, every building block has its reason to exist. Starting out from the customer job, hey, what are these people trying to get done? What am I offering them? How am I reaching them? Hey, sophisticated channel strategy that's going to create recurring revenues. That's when you have a story here where every one of the nine building blocks reinforce each other. I call these the masters. So if you're serious about creating a startup, I would advise you to very quickly move from here to here. Now let's say you created a successful startup. That's a danger zone, because you get lazy. I would suggest you start thinking of a level three strategy, where you know what? You just created a successful business model, but you know that while you're still a rising star, you already want to think of the next business model. And that's where I'm pretty amazed by companies like Amazon and Apple, because while they were still successful, they started creating not just new products, but new business models. And sometimes, the new business model is cannibalizing the old one. But they prefer doing it themselves than letting others do it. So when Apple launched the iPad, they knew that this is going to have a negative impact on their, on their um, laptop sales. So they knew if they're not going to do it first, well, it might be done by somebody else. So, these people here, I call them the invincible. It's impossible to compete, to outcompete a company that's disrupting itself while they're still successful. Okay, now let, let me finish this off with an image I actually got from Steve Blank. He said, you know what, there's a nice visual image to that. Let's test your visual understanding skills again. When you compete just on your on your product. This is basically 
what you're competing with. Anybody know what this is? Can you see this? Can you? A bit of imagination, please. Bicycle. It's a bicycle. Good. <laughs> Looks like a value proposition. Yeah, it's not a value proposition. <laughs> what is this? Training wheels. Training wheels, right? So if you just compete on product, it's like you know, you're competing on training wheels. Now that you understand business models, you don't want to compete with training wheels anymore. You want to compete with what's this? Motorcycle. It's not just a motorcycle, it's a Ducati monster. <laughs> you can see that? So, I think the whole challenge for entrepreneurs and for corporate entrepreneurs will be to understand how can I move from this to this. Okay? And I think we now have the methodologies to do this. If you're not using them, you're probably going to compete here and you're probably going to be out-competed by others. Now, I'll stop with this here, and I'll go to this idea of experimentation. Um, maybe just one last thing, which is pretty important, which is a hard one to get right, and I'll get Steve back here. <coughs> this idea of prototyping business models. Any of you have a design education in here? Who's a designer? Okay, great. An architect, product design, industrial design? Um, interaction design. Interaction design, right? So, I'll take a different uh, design profession here, architecture. One thing that <coughs> designers do extremely well because they're taught how to do this is prototyping. And what is prototyping about? I'll give you an example with Frank Gehry. So Frank Gehry was brought in, famous architect, to create the Guggenheim Museum, which was supposed to transform the city of Bilbao, which they achieved. When they started out, thinking about this building, it was not just creative genius, heavenly intuition, whatever you want. No, it was a very structured creative process where they went through hundreds of prototypes, very different alternatives before they chose a direction. That's something we're not taught in business, to prototype and to experiment. But you know what? It's the same thing in business. In fact, rather than sticking with your first idea and writing a business plan, you know, no business plan survives the first contact with customer. customers. You want to start playing around with very rough prototype ideas and then pick one and start going to test it. And when I mean different ideas, I mean one could be a platform business, one could be a business with no fixed costs, only variable costs, one could be a business model where you give away your product, where you license your product. Very different possibilities. Now, if you spend an afternoon on making a prototype, you're probably going to lose your time. If you spend 15 minutes on sketching out three different ideas, you're going to learn a lot. This process, prototyping, is what designers do to get the ideas to evolve. But I love this quote where Tom Lutek, designer at Autodesk, says, prototyping is the conversation you have with your ideas. And they're used to working with very rough ideas because they know they can't get it right immediately. They need to prototype and play. And an important part of prototyping is testing the business model. I'm going to skip this part here. Back to it maybe later on. Now, how do you test your business model? This is where Steve was supposed to come in, but I know he was very eager to. Let's get you back on stage, Steve. Come on. And well, when we wrote the book, there was one missing piece, which is didn't know. That was, you know what? Even if you have a great business model canvas sketched out and it looks like it's going to work. This is where Steve's book taught me, and at that point it was the, the, the Four Steps to the Epiphany, and now it's the new version, right? The, the, the Startup Startup Owner's Manual. Manual. Where you taught me, hey, you know what? Even the best canvas is still a series of guesses. What do you, what did you mean with this? Well, you know, one of the interesting things uh, uh, that I learned painfully in these startups is that there are no facts inside your building, so get the heck out of there. Um, and for those of you who've done entrepreneurship, uh, there's one thing to kind of talk about it, to write nice plans, to put together spreadsheets, etc. 
Uh, but there really are no facts. All you have are opinions. Uh, and while you might be the titular CEO and someone else might have the title of sales or marketing or engineering, uh, all you're kind of doing is having your egos kind of <laughs> tested across the room. Because I'll contend that the first person in the room, whether it's your admin or the most junior person in the company, kind of wins. Meaning if somebody brings in a fact, they just <coughs> beat everything you've been talking about. And so why don't we have a process to actually take all your guesses and somehow figure out uh, whether these hypotheses are true or not. Because while how many of you kind of like think this was kind of cool? Come on, come on, was the right kind of cool? Right? You've just wasted an hour. With all due respect, what you've got after an hour is another piece of paper with stickies. <laughs> the only thing that makes this real is you now need to get outside. And outside your classroom, outside your office, outside your building, and physically turn what you have in front of you, which is a faith-based hypothesis, into facts. And you need some process to do that. And the customer development process and the startup owner's manual of my co-author, who's sitting in the back, Bob Dorf, um, you know, came up with, um, uh, is that process. So, so what was the question? Me, his, his, there was no question. Yeah. He started telling his story. <laughs> <laughs> After insulting him, <laughs> but the, the amazing thing is how well these two pieces fit together. Give me an example of how you're actually teaching this to real entrepreneurs today. How does this process look like in the classroom and in the real world? So at uh, Stanford, at Berkeley, at uh, uh, now here uh, at a school up north called Columbia, uh, you know, an inferior school for here, I know, <laughs> but uh, uh, and at Princeton in the fall. And for the National Science Foundation, we teach a class called the Lean Launchpad. And if anybody wants to take a look and see what the slides look like and the process looks like, you go to my website at uh, steveblank.com and get some detail. But basically, we integrate the business model canvas and the customer development process by having students apply for the class by having to fill out the same business model canvas you did. You have to take your idea put it on the canvas, and that's your application as a team to get into the class. And then on day one, instead of going around and saying, hi, my name is X, your team stands up, literally, the first day, and presents their first version of the business model canvas. The teaching team is sitting in the back of the room, trying not to laugh hysterically in front of you guys, and we're actually grading you guys on a shared Google document, but when you're done, we'll give you, quote, a critique which is a provider, polite version, is we'll take a two by four to the side of your team's head um, and send you guys, when you're done <coughs> presenting, we'll give you a lecture about one component of the canvas every day. There's some of my students calling right now, complaining. Um, and you will get out of the building, literally day by day in the class, and talk to customers to start validating your hypothesis. You'll come back the next day or next week, depending on how often the class is held, and you'll update your canvas, and your team will present again your new canvas. We'll give you more critiques. You'll go out again. The course of a semester class, students are taking a full course load. Talk to an average of 100 to 120 customers. They pivot their canvas multiple times. Now think about this. We're not talking about a survey monkey with 100 customers. We're talking about eyeball contact with 100 customers. And some of them survey hundreds, if not thousands. Now, you can't tell me that you could find that same data sitting in the library here at Stern. You just can't. There's no way you possibly can compute that. And the funniest thing is there is no possible way on day one we could convince the students that their first <coughs> business model canvas is wrong. I mean, we could talk to her blue in the face, we could have lectured the whole semester. And then what we do for their final presentation is make them play back each campus week by week like a film strip. And for the first time in the history of entrepreneurship, we could see the evolution of an idea over time based on customer feedback. And so we not only use the canvas as the initial way to write down the hypotheses, but we use it to keep score. I call it the scorecard score as we're learning. So that's, uh, that's how we teach this uh, integrated process. Now, let me just bring this back to comparing it to the business plan. If we're asking you another question, you know, this is what you were saying, right? First canvas. Yep. This is what students present. Yep. And 
The business plan is just a more refined version of this with more detail, right? Correct? Yep. Now, the process that Steve was describing here is that, you know what? It's just a piece of paper with a lot of guesses. You want to get out of the building, start talking to customers, and depending on what you learn, you're going to change your business model because maybe your customers aren't interested in the product, right? Or the channels will not shelf your product. Right. And, and every day, the, yep. you come up with a new one, right? So right. that's how it works. And one of the interesting things that we now know is you'll get feedback from customers who might say, oh, the price ought to be you know, $9.99 versus $4.99. That's an iteration. But every once in a while, you're, you'll hear something where customers will just kind of teach you something important. They'll say, no, 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 that's not the problem, but this is the problem. Or you'll learn that the customer segments are not teens 18 to 22, that they really are women in the Midwest 35 to 50. That's a substantive change to a business model component. The definition of when you change one or more of the canvas components is called a pivot. A pivot, a pivot is simply defined as a substantive change to one or more of the business model components. One of my students, uh, Eric Reese, who wrote a good book called The Lean Startup. Anybody seen it or read it? Yeah. Um, uh, Eric gave this name to a drawing in the customer development process I had for years, and I thought it was a much better name than it's that arrow. Um, and, and when you use the business model canvas, you could further refine a pivot as saying, take a look at any of the one of the nine boxes, you make it a substantive change, and you've just pivoted. And let me just, Alexander, you were talking about the business plan. Let me tie this back to stuff that happens in the real world. Anybody ever been in a startup where you fire the VP of sales? Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever been that VP of sales? <laughs> so, so in the back, so shh, don't tell them. Turns out, in a real startup, what happens, probably every nine seconds, somewhere in the world, the VP of sales is getting fired in a startup. And they're getting fired in a startup because they didn't make the plan. Right? The plan are those theoretical numbers that you put together at, under the influence of something in the back of your, you might ever put together a revenue plan in the back? Right? Right? What were you doing at that time when you, I won't ask, right? It's a guilty look. It turns out you hire VP of sales, they think that there was some God-given gift of a plan, you just kind of made it up. Your best guess. It turns out the way we used to do startups is we used to fire executives when they didn't match the plan. Now we're doing something radically different. We're firing the plan when it doesn't match reality. That's a big insight. We're changing the plan by saying, oh my gosh, the customer segments, those are the things that are wrong. No wonder why we can't make our numbers, or no wonder why we can't achieve uh, maximum potential out of a startup. Or our value proposition is wrong, or our revenue model is wrong. We are gonna iterate and pivot as we learn from customers until we find something that it can, it can extract value, uh, maximum value. Because, can I do one more? Yeah. And yes, one. Because for the <laughs> last 50 years, much like we never quite understood what a business model was, we never understood fundamentally what a startup was. I'm going to give you Steve's definition, which matches what Alexander's been teaching. A startup is a temporary organization designed to search for repeatable and scalable business model. And it's worth parsing that. One is temporary organization means there isn't any eight-year-old startups. There are two-year-old startups attached to six-year-old failures. Now to think about that. It's a temporary organization because the goal of a startup is to become a company, not to stay a startup, even though that feels comfortable. Right? You get to bring your dog and you get free food, etc. But that's not the goal. Right? The goal is to become a large company. Designed to search not to execute, and this is really interesting, the customer development process, the process you're doing outside the building, is not hiring salespeople, or doing press releases, or having launch parties. It's actually to learn which part of the business model is correct or incorrect. Repeatable and scalable means if you're going to spend a dollar, do you get a dollar plus something, two dollars, or end users, or more stuff. Business model, we now know what that is. So a startup is a temporary organization designed to search for repeatable and scalable business model. And how many of you are engineers? And some of you might be freaking out going, where's the product in that definition? 
And the point is the product is just part of the business plan, <coughs> business model. It's part of the value proposition. Your job is not just to build the, uh, the product. Your job is to search for the entire business model. Again, Steve. I forgot what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> That's <my> question. <laughs> Steve, now, you are a successful entrepreneur, right? You can do it without the process. Are we not as smart as you are and that we need a process to do this? Or what's the lesson? Uh, this is a leading question to something I'm not sure <laughs> where it's leading. So <laughs> well, give, give me another hint, Alex. Why, <laughs> why would Sounds anybody, like two of it, you know, three <laughs> Why would anybody want to use this? Whereas you know, there are a lot of examples of successful entrepreneurs that have no process. Okay. So, uh, you know, one of the things is if I was selling you something, I would tell you this is the process. Um, but we're not. We're just telling you after 50 years, we kind of now understand that it's a lot more efficient, and that we now over, know over time that if you follow a methodology like this, I guarantee you, you will not become Apple and Facebook. Those are black swans. Meaning, I, I don't know how to predict those. But I will guarantee you that you will fail a heck of a lot less. We now know that there's enough data that says if you have a methodology, early stage ventures last a lot longer because we are going to eliminate the first hundred stupid moves you can make. We're just going to eliminate them. Now, most of you will invent your own new hundred stupid rules, uh, but it won't cost you as much as not having a process. Is that? So we had a, uh, you know, the canonical one, there was a team in one of the schools I taught at that decided there was nothing cooler than building a robotic lawnmower. They thought that was, it was great. They were, oh, no, look, we can put GPS and lasers and shoot every grass blade and, you know, it like have sensors. It was great. There was a bunch of engineers. It was wonderful. Um, and they called it auto, auto no mo. You know, and, gee, why are you taking this class? Oh, we're going to just implement this idea. Ha, ha, ha. And we said, oh, really? And who are the customers? Oh, we didn't think much about that. And I guess, you know, big golf courses and Everything else, great, good. And they put together their business model canvas and it looked pretty and it was going to be about technology. And we said, great, why don't you go talk to those groundskeepers and, you know, people who golf courses. And uh, by the way, I said, you know, you might want to do a cheap bill of materials and figure out how much the device costs before you go talk to them. And they did. And they came back for the next class and they were just kind of, oh, oh no. <laughs> well, what happened? Well, we talked to them. Well, what happened then? Oh, they were really excited. Oh, great. Well, they want. Well, we told them how much it would cost. Well, how much would it cost? $280,000. What did they say? Well, we got two guys who would make minimum wage who do that now. I said, so what did they say? No. <laughs> well, now what? Well, we don't know. I said, well, did you ever think that perhaps there was another market for your technology? Well, no. Who else needs grass cut? I said, well, you guys are thinking about grass. You know, can this, because they had some machine vision technology that was pretty sophisticated to make sure they were, you know, cutting the grass and, you know, not going off into the road somewhere. I said, did you ever think about going to farmers and farm fields? Well, why would we do that? I said, well, they have weeds. And so, believe it or not, Silicon Valley is about 80 miles from the San Francisco Central Valley. And they went out and talked to farmers. And they found out that for organic farms, which have to hand weed, Weeding was a huge issue. And it wasn't just replacing one person. They were using hundreds, if not thousands, of workers, most of them illegal, to kind of hand pick weeds. And when they told them that there was a device that might be able to robotically solve this problem, the farmers got really excited. So the next week, the students came back. We found it. We're done with the class, whatever. And I said, well, let me explain to you guys. You are building hardware, right? Oh, absolutely, this will be great. Next year we'll build it. And I said, and you guys are Stanford engineers. Oh, I, I told you what school it was. <laughs> well, because that's part of the story. Is, I said, well, where's the prototype? He said, Professor Blank, you just don't understand. You don't build a machine vision robot in a, you know, a semester. I said, no, 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 next Tuesday. <laughs> and they said, there's no way. We are, I said, let me show you something that you guys and your parents have probably never seen before. I know you've, you've probably never seen this before. So I went up to the whiteboard and drew the letter B. I said, have you ever seen this as a grade at Stanford? 
no, you can't do that. We've never seen that. We, you know, <laughs> I said, next Tuesday, no way, we're, we're going to drop the class, blah, blah, blah. Next Tuesday, these guys came in looking like, <laughs> and they brought in the Carrot Bot. And the Carrot Bot was a machine vision platform uh, that actually was able to find weeds, and they showed, brought in photos of not only them building the Carrot Bot, but them taking it out to the farm fields in the Salinas Valley. And the last thing they wanted to do is mount a surplus DARPA high-powered laser on it to kill them. I said, no, 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 they're going to kill a farm worker in the middle of this. Thing. For God's sake, don't do that. Uh, to make a long story short, not only did the farmers love this, but here was the kill. Not only did they do a pivot once, but they still thought they were selling hardware and asset. The farmers taught them, hey, you know, we buy services all the time. Why aren't you charging us? per density of the weeds. And we'd be happy to pay you or a third party as a weeding service. And then you could like amortize the cost of your machine over multiple years in multiple farms. And your machines could be busy 24-7 because they could work in the dark as well as the day. Now, all of a sudden, it hit me that as smart as these guys were, there is no possible way they could have figured this out sitting in a classroom. There's just no way. I mean, there just was insufficient in information. And so I tell this story, because not only that it was an interesting pivot and nice hardware and they built the prototype, but their revenue model came from so far afield. Now, now just the last punchline is, um, they actually found that this is a company. They graduated and they said, this is such a good idea, we learned so much in the class, and they're now a robotic weeding company you know, uh, working on high value crops and so on. No. So, um, I don't know if that was the question either, but it was a great story. <laughs> great story. <laughs> that last question before we open it up to the floor, maybe. Um, it sounds like a lot of technology companies are already using this. Are you seeing this being adopted more by um, service companies as well, or is that not? So, so one of the things that make uh, the business model of Canvas and customer development work all over is uh, it works in large corporations, it works in startups. You know, I tend to teach in technology companies. But um, the record for progress in a class was not this auto nomo company. It was uh, when I was teaching in the business school at Berkeley, um, I had a team come in at class at week seven of eight. Now every week you need to come in and show us a big number of customers you talk to. And this week the team came in and said, we didn't talk to any customers. And I said, what? We didn't talk to any customers. And they were proud of it. Now normally if you say that in my class, that's the last time you get to sit down for about a week because um, it's, it's a painful experience. And they said, no, we're going to show you one slide. And I'm going, what is it? What are these guys doing? They put up one slide, and it's the record so far. It was a check for half a million dollars as an order from their first customer, and this was a beef jerky company. So it's called Crave, if anybody wants to look at them. And they're now in most of the supermarkets in the United States. So it works from anything from consumer products to service products. Uh, it's just like the canvas is independent of technology. Uh, the customer development process works exactly the same way. My question is about getting involved with this kind of, you know, you, you need a certain kind of evangelical fervor to do this. And, and when you insert yourself into an organization that really isn't ready for it, and you're not the lead designer, or you're not, you know, the, the entrepreneur. Don't do it. Your idea. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Um, you know, it's, um, you could be the true believer, but unless you're leading the charge, this has to be done by the founders. And meaning, I'm glad you have it, but this cannot be a bottoms-up approach. Um, or as Alexander said, it's true career suicide. For lots of psychological reasons, not because you're wrong, you're actually right. But being the evangelical when someone else has a different mental model on how they're running their startup just puts you on a career uh, collision course, which they're so fixated for executing their model, there really is no bandwidth for them to, in the middle of a startup, to adopt yours. Yeah. And anybody working in a large organization or planning to work in a large organization beyond 500, 600, 3,000 people? 3, yeah. We're going to have a bid for the largest company. <laughs> so uh, this is an important question related to, you know, can you do this in large companies? And yes, you can, but some conditions should be in place 
before, otherwise it's career suicide if you try to do this. So I usually draw this picture, which is, you know, you have existing business models. Let's take, you know, G. They have a series of business models, and they can improve those, and they can bring in a new product. They will, you know, really execute in a business line with a business model that they already know. There, it's all about execution, okay? Over here, when we're talking about new business models, it's not about execution, it's about the search. Now, what do you need to be able to do in a large company when you're searching for a business model? You need to be able to fail and talk about that failure and continuously. Because if you don't fail and learn and pivot, you're probably never going to build an, an innovative business model that's different from the one that, that they're executing. So here, you start out with some business models, but it's really an iterative process of failing, learning, and then ultimately succeeding at, at one point. But if you fail today in large companies, it's for your suicide. It's a totally different mental model. So you need the organizational space that allows you to do this. And what you were saying is if the top doesn't buy in to this, there's no chance it's going to happen. Or in a large company, if you're not set up as a separate division, kind of uh, away from everybody else. Our best example, Bob and I were uh, helped to start the new energy systems uh, division at General Electric. Um, and uh, uh, Prescott Logan was the general manager who was kind of chartered by Jeff Ilmo to go do this. And he had enough space to do it. He had Bob out and a great story about how he called us up and said, I think I'm in trouble. And they just gave me a division and they told me to break ground for the factory, but we don't think we have customers. And it was, uh, he actually had the space and he had the political cover to pull off a great division at, at the general electric. You got time for another couple? Another, one more question? Two, two question. more, two, two last more. questions. And we have a few different, I don't know whether they're different segments or different models, and I was just wondering a clarifying question. For example, one of our segments would be appealing directly to consumers, language learners, in like an online environment. Another model or another segment would be appealing to schools and using it in language learning class. Would, would those be different segments of the same model, or would those be different models? Okay. Yeah. I'll ask you with a different example, and I'll ask everybody here, is this a pretty important question? Um, who, who are the customers of Google? What are the customer segments of Google? And, and Advertisers? Searchers. And searchers. So you have two very different customer segments with two very different jobs. Could the model exist without the searchers, their business model? Could it exist without the advertisers? Obviously not. That's what you call a double-sided market, where you have two segments, you have two different value propositions, two different channels, two different revenue streams, and the model can only exist if you have both, or in a multi-sided market, more. So in that case, you need both segments. Now, it sounds like your case is pretty different. What you want to look at is, if you address both segments, are there very clear synergies to address both segments? then you probably want to make one model. If they are very different, so the backstage is very different in you know, addressing one segment and the other, you probably want to, if you're following Steve's advice, you want to pick one to start with and test, right? Yeah, I, I, I'd pick one, do a deep dive, and then pop out and figure out whether it was a viable business. Okay. I think we had another question there, yeah? Um, what would you suggest for a situation that where failure cost is tight. So let's say it's a social innovation and you're working with the homeless. And you can't really run experiments because their lives are on the line. Right? You can't just be like, we're going to experiment with a new model for a soup kitchen. Because, Why not? because when they start depending on it, you can't just change your model. They're depending on it. You've, you've set it up that, that in your head that you have no choice. And I'm trying to push back at you saying right. you do have a choice and you didn't hear it or didn't believe. So which part was hard? I guess the, what, the part that's hard is the responsibility. Right, so you have just forced, and this happens a lot to entrepreneurs, you get so like this, you blind yourself to that there are other possibilities on how you've constructed the problem. And the way you have just constructed the problem, there is no solution. What I've tried to push back to you is, 
if you take a deep breath and exhale and believe the world won't end, if you start being, no, I want to be serious here because uh, it's not just you. Lots of entrepreneurs believe the existential crisis they're having at the moment has never happened to anybody else in the world. Uh, and, and, and instead, step back and go, great, the world won't end. What is some other way to approach this problem? And I don't want to, can't solve the problem for you. I'm just telling you, I've heard this, this story before, not in soup kitchens, but in other places, and you are so focused that the world will end if you do anything different, then you shut yourself down from being able to be creative about the business model. And it's not only you, it's just something that happens. Let me just expand this for about five seconds. When you're an entrepreneur, particularly a founder, it's a very lonely place. Right? You think you're responsible, and you also make the mistake thinking no one else has ever been here before. It's kind of like when you have some personal crisis, you think no one else has ever had a personal crisis like this, you know, ever. A lot of people not are going, well, yes. It turns out it's human nature. We never quite think, oh, yeah, this is pattern 422. That's why psychologists <laughs> exist, and that's why they make a lot of money, because when you're sitting down telling them you're a tail of all, they're going, it is number four for the day. <laughs> so human things are kind of wired, thinking, you know, when it's happening to us, can't be it's ever happened to anybody else, whether it's your personal life, social life, and I just want to extend it to your business life. The reason why the business model canvas and customer development works is, I hate to give you about the good news and bad news, is that there are just simply patterns to business that aren't infinite. There are kind of finite things that we can now kind of predict and tell you a logical outcome. The answer to your question is, uh, my answer on different from and Steve answered is, you, will, you can find a solution for what hasn't worked as a scalable business model. But what you really want to look at is, what matters at the end of the day is how big is your impact? So what is worth more? Trying to figure out, you know, can I find um, some kind of solution for that problem? Might not be optimal, but you, know, you move on with your testing to ultimately find a business model that is going to have a much bigger impact than if you get stuck with the one that's not working. So what you really want to look at is what is that business model that is going to have an impact. So you're adding actually to the traditional metrics of profit is the metrics of you know, <coughs> is the financial success of the company. You're adding another one, which is impact. And I think the amazing thing today is you can create business models that have an impact and make an insane profit, where profit is not at the expense of impact, and impact is not at the expense of profit. But that requires a lot of search because it's even more difficult. You just added another cost. Right? Okay. All right. I Thank you very much.